Hi guys, I'm Diana from Happy Tipsy and we are at Law Gordon Law Center, Judy Goenka University, Guru Gram. We are with Chef Tom Milligan who is the Culinary Arts Technical Director, Australia. And how are you Chef? How is your journey so far in India? Uh, very good, very good. It's very good to be here. My first time in India, so looking forward to the rest of the trip. How was your day like today? Today was very exciting. It was a, a full-on day. Uh, this morning we had two hours to prepare the, the menu mise en place for the uh, for the demonstration this afternoon. I was working with some really fantastic young people. I mean, the Cordon Bleu has some fantastic uh, students studying with us, so they were very interested, very keen. Okay. So yes, it's been great. What were you making? Was it something yeah. uh, indigenous or yeah, today was it something? We were, uh, we're working with the French culinary arts, of course, with the Cordon Bleu, so that's what we're famous for. Mm -hmm. So we deliver a French uh, menu, yeah. entree, main course, and dessert. Yeah. We also, uh, coming from Australia, we were uh, using indigenous Australian products mixed in with the, with the French techniques. Okay. So it was very, very interesting. I am told that you made pani puri with that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Did we you taste it? A little bit of fun, yeah. Uh -huh. We started with pani puri. Right. A little, uh, and then we filled it with uh, a tomato foam. Uh huh. And then we dust it with uh, wattle seed from Australia, wattle seed, toasted wattle seeds. So, so was what was the feeling like, you know, bringing indigenous yeah. Australian ingredient, mixing it with Indian stuff and then creating something new all together? That's right, and some French, work, uh, and French techniques too. So, yeah, I think we wanted to have some fun today and uh, make it lighthearted for the students because sometimes the students feel a little bit intimidated. I'm so sure. we just wanted to bring some, you know, how we can mix it up. And Australia is famous for its freestyle food. Yeah. You know, so we like to think that we have a uh, food without boundaries. Mm -hmm. we, we take the world cuisine, we mix it all up, and then we bring it out and we call it Australian freestyle. So um, I'm, you know, after seeing and you know studying your profile, we've come to know that you have widely travelled. You were raised in England, yet you chose to uh, settle down in Australia. You also widely travelled and worked in different places. So how has it been like? What made you choose this industry? Why? Why did you? I mean, ultimately, why did you decide to become a chef yeah. as a young boy? Yeah. Well, I think. Uh like most uh, people, they either fall into the kitchen accidentally, and I was one of those. You know, I uh, always wanted to work mm -hmm. in uh, with food. I always loved uh, cooking at home, and so when an opportunity came to uh, go to uh, technical school, as it was called in those days, I went to uh, I joined uh, a technical college, mm -hmm. and then from there I joined the. Uh, what was known as British Transport Hotels at the time, was the Railway Hotels. Okay. And uh, joined them as an apprentice, and then I was mentored by a French chef there, Yeah. Uh, Pierre Vades, who was a very, very important, turned out to be a very important person in my life, sort of pointed me in the right direction, just uh, uh, had faith in me and said I could do this as a profession, mm -hmm. just mentored me along the way, so it was fantastic, and it's been a great journey. You started from the scratch being an apprentice, yeah. so what has that taught you? as you know like the first to turn into the person you are today yeah i think uh, like you say starting early yeah uh, i would say it's not necessary uh, as important as it may have been in the past i think uh, my experience uh, being an executive chef is that young people who have studied something in the past mm -hmm. or maybe uh, finished high school and done a degree this type of thing and moved into the kitchen later on yeah. and uh, joined a really accelerated program mm -hmm. generally work out to be much better entrepreneurs yeah. and much better chefs to be okay. because they have uh, a lot of other skills mm -hmm. that maybe we and so we sort of miss that sort of pattern I would say Okay, so but uh, you have widely travelled. Yeah. Uh, do you do you see any kind of commonality in food and these different diversity that you have seen? Yeah, I think I think I was only talking to uh, colleagues recently about how we present food very differently now because of Instagram and because of social media, all of those sort of things. We Correct. we're very very conscious of how the food looks now. Yeah. But the reality is that people still want to have good wholesome food. Mm -hmm. And uh, however it's presented, if it doesn't taste fantastic and it doesn't remind them of what the real taste is about, yeah. then they certainly won't come to a restaurant. So you really still need to have the taste and flavor of your food. Right. Yeah. So this brings us to a very important question. Um, when you are moving, uh, when the culinary tradition is moving towards progressive cuisines and when we are really talking about the look and the visualization of the entire 
food that we're presenting to the customers. And in India especially, there is a movement, it seems, we are going towards promoting Indian food and promoting lo local cuisine everywhere. So. How do you think uh, we should? How do you think the chefs can strike a balance between originality and authenticity, and also balance it with taste uh, and what is already into progressive uh, taste? Yeah. I think uh, it, you know there's, there's there's really extremes. Yeah. Like Gogan in, the, in Thailand, you know, where the, the food is really contemporary and cutting edge. Mm -hmm. I think you know going but. The reality is, you can't get away from the authentic taste. Yeah. And I think the authentic presentation reality is not far away. I think uh, if you stay true to yourself mm -hmm. and really believe in yourself, I think the food and the, uh, the quality and the taste comes through. Right. I mean, there's no. I mean, there's no magic wand why one restaurant works mm -hmm. and one other doesn't. You know, like you say, you could open next door to a, another restaurant. Yeah. But I think the, the reality is, is if, if you're a good hospitality person, mm -hmm. then people are going to come to your restaurant. Good, good service mm -hmm. is equally as important as good food. You right. must have a service, you must have proper service, yeah. you must have hospitable service, you must be friendly, yeah. and of course the food needs to be good and yeah. tasty and authentic. Right. As a chef, uh, how do you express yourself through food? Say, I know a lot of chefs, yeah. they do express themselves through food. Yeah. I know people, yeah. chefs especially, who are who yeah. are from the you know seashore areas, yeah. they express through food very elegantly. Yeah. So how yeah. do you express, especially yeah. from the point that uh, you were born and raised in England, you've yeah. seen what food over there oh, tastes like, cool. feel like, and then to move to a different place uh, and keep moving around, widely traveling, and then uh, how do you find well, your expression to food? Well, I still express myself. I mean, I would say people know when Tom Milligan puts food on the plate. Yeah, and, and, exactly. And as, as we go through our life experiences, you see other uh, influences coming in. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you uh, copy others. Mm -hmm. It's a case of you're just bringing in um, things that you see along your journey. And it's yeah. a life journey. So for myself, you know, after, after coming to India, yeah. no doubt about it. Uh, after spending these uh, three weeks here, I'll go back to Australia, and there will be influences come through on my place for sure. For sure, yeah. That's how it happens. It just we'll look forward to it. <laughs> so I uh, would like to ask another burden question. When you know you were brought up in England, you have tasted, you know how the food over there feels like, yeah. and then to move to Australia, how have you seen Australian cuisine? develop oh, and grow. Yeah. I mean, it's significant. I mean, I, I arrived in Australia in 1988. Yeah. So it's a long time ago. Right. And we were, uh, there was a real movement uh, in exactly what you say, expressing yourself. There was an avant-garde movement with a whole range of uh, chefs across the country who were really doing inspirational inspirational things, you know, Maggie Pierre, Chong Lu, a whole range of great chefs doing some great work. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to be working. Uh, we were opening the Hyatt in Adelaide at the time, yeah. and we were doing some very, very interesting things. We had a, uh, we were uh, promoting organics and biodynamics. Yeah. So we were buying unpasteurized milk and cream, and we were buying all our vegetables um, from organic suppliers. So when I uh, joined the Hyatt in Australia, I always say that I started my apprenticeship all over again because yeah. I had this whole new market of ingredients to yeah. express myself with and what have you. And so I've really followed and, and, uh, and made some very, very interesting uh, discoveries mm -hmm. in Australia. Well, that's great. But uh, when you developed yourself as a full-fledged Australian chef mm -hmm. coming from England, did you face any challenge over there? No, not really. I think. Uh, we just didn't embrace the culture, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, coming from England, I just thought Australia would be very similar. <laughs> okay. But of course, it's not. I mean, we have so many uh, very, very right. uh, different, uh, different uh, ingredients to use, and you know, there's a whole range of different things happening. So, so, but Australia now, particularly now, it's a very, very exciting and vibrant place to, to, uh, to be cooking. So, so you get you can work with so many great ingredients, and like you say, there's some great Indian chefs doing some great work. Right. Some great Malaysian chefs. There's, there's chefs from all around the world. African food is becoming a very, very important uh, right. uh, 
uh, cuisine in, in Australia too. So you know, this this it's a world culture. You know, it's a fantastic right. place to be. It's a universal culture yeah, now. Right. I have two very important questions, which normally any hospitality student or aspiring chef uh, would ask. So, first one is. How do you speed your speed up your process in the kitchen? Because a lot of chefs do find a lot of difficulty in making up to the time that is asked yeah, to them to prepare right. a dish. Second of all, uh, are is mentorship really important for a chef? I mean, you have personally been uh, mentored by a lot of great chefs. What inputs have you been getting from them as a, you know as a young chef, and how has it helped you? Well, I, I, I think I have to say the first question: How do you uh, speed up your uh, time management? The time the management, all of those sort of things. We have a term in in the French kitchen and in, uh, in the kitchen in general. Now it's been adopted from from all cuisines, and that's getting your mise en place ready. Yeah, everything in its place. You know, so in the Cordon Bleu, we we really specialize in uh, the organization skills, mm -hmm. making sure the person can multitask. Because, mm -hmm. like you say, we have to be able to get the whole uh, menu ready. Yeah, and by uh, having a structure uh, as an executive chef and as a as a young chef in the kitchen has always been a process. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the young chef will start in the in the uh, stewing area in the dishwashing. Yeah. So learn how to wash the dishes, understand uh, uh, if if you get the pot extremely dirty, how difficult it is to clean it, and the yeah. time that it takes to do yeah. that. Correct. And then you, then we move into the cold larder, generally speaking, the cold kitchen. Yeah. And you learn all about the salad prep and all of those sort of things, and how to get things done in a, in a methodical manner. Yeah. It is a military type process, so mm -hmm. it being methodical and organized. If you're an organized person, that helps. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, you know because the, we, we cater for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're in a fine dining environment, you're only cooking for sixty people. Right. You'll be doing a significant amount of very difficult tasks. Right. So, but if you're cooking for, you know, 500 people in a banquet situation, it'll be a lot simpler, but it's still volume. Yeah. So you've still got to be very, very organized. So staying organized, making lists, making what we call mise en place lists, prep lists, uh -huh. and, and all of those sort of, uh, you know, not necessarily a, a gun chart, but a critical path of action for the day mm -hmm. before you leave work the, the day before, ready for the following day. Right. Also helps. Okay. You know, so that you're always ahead of yourself, ahead of yourself, knowing your customers all those things. Excellent. So, yeah, no, that's very very important. But uh, getting to the second question of mentor. Yeah. You know, I've been mentored by some great people along along the way to keep you involved in the kitchen because it does become a very difficult task and if you're a young person mm -hmm. when you're sacrificing your weekends and your birthdays and your holidays and what have you just to work in the kitchen because you, you, you know what everything we do is it's, it's the hospitality industry but it's very inhospitable for people who are working in it right. and getting to understand that you have to have your life work-life balance outside of the regular hours mm -hmm. you're starting to balance those and those sort of things and you know, having people who say, you know, have faith in you and trust you to do the right thing, because it's a very interesting uh, industry to be involved in now, particularly right. now, because now we've got so many, uh, you know, the new uh, chefs are the new stars. Yeah. You know? So now there's so many uh, great opportunities for young cooks coming through in the industry. Yeah. I've got an interesting question for the Institute. So, um, well, you've traveled across the world, you're now here in India. How do you think the institute accommodates all this diversity under one roof? Oh, I think uh, the Cordon Bleu you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the Cordon Bleu, uh, Mr. Conto's philosophy is fantastic. Uh, the Cordon Bleu's philosophy is amazing, you know, where we basically uh, spreading the French culture and the French way of life through gastronomy throughout the world uh -huh. is fantastic. Right. And like you say, and, and, and by having that diversity, mm -hmm. using French culinary arts as the foundation, and basically what the Cordon Bleu is, it's a foundation mm -hmm. of, of good culinary practice and then every uh, culture around the world can build on that. You know, we have schools in Japan, we have schools now in, uh, you know, in the Philippines, or uh, schools in Mexico. Right. So everyone you know, is, is most likely going to be a, a Cordon Bleu everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. and bringing all of those cultures together under the foundation of the Cordon Bleu mm -hmm. is fantastic. And, and I think that's what I like to say to all of our students who come and study with the Cordon Bleu is 
French uh, Culinary Arts Foundation is, mm -hmm. is the best foundation to, to build on. It's like you know a person learning the classical piano who's <laughs> moving into rock and roll or moves into jazz. It's right. very straightforward for them to do that. Yeah. But if you just study jazz, it's very difficult to go into the classics because you don't really understand those foundations. But right. in the Culinary Arts, there's no better school in the Corps Bleu to do that. Wow. Okay. Um, so how does the institute and its uh, the courses that it's catering, how does it help the students to become food entrepreneurs? Like you say, I mean, the, the philosophy of the Corps of Bleu, and, and like you say, the, uh, the students who study at the Corps of Bleu mm -hmm. and the teachers that work at the Corps of Bleu, the Corps of Bleu brand itself only attracts the best of the best. Right. You know, and, and so the, the course itself is uh, is it a very very good foundation, like I say. Mm -hmm. uh, but most most uh, uh, students have been mixing with the best chefs, and the best instructors, the best teachers. Right. And so when they finish the school, they're, they're so excited about moving on, and they've been networking with a lot of good people, so they understand what is necessary to be a good business person, to be a successful business person. Right. So uh, this one, well, just last question, I would like to ask. Uh, when you talk about the food entrepreneurship aspect of Le Corps Bleu, uh, how important is it for you to impart not just culinary knowledge to the students, but to also develop business acumen in it? Yeah, that's it. So, uh, how are you doing it? Okay. And there are students, uh, especially from India, who would like to go and be a part of the institute in Paris, in London, or in Japan. So, is there a precise reason why they would want to choose something like that? Or uh, is it just the same that if they study in India or in Australia or Paris? No, I think, I think there's, uh, there is differences. Okay. You know, I like to think that Australia is the best <laughs> quote of learning world. Yeah. So, and I think we have a very good uh, structure to uh, give the student best outcome, particularly in leadership and entrepreneurship yeah. and that uh, throughout the course, by the time they finish their advanced diploma, they've written their own business plan which is robust and good enough and strong enough to be able to go to the bank or go to partners and uh, put it on the line to, to, to get it uh, approved. And we've got so many uh, success stories in uh, Australia who have gone on to do significant uh, Businesses, because of the way that uh, Le Port of Bleu have taught them the understanding of business acumen. Yeah. There's so many chefs I know, even so many chefs over my journey, who you know really don't understand the costs involved in running a business and still buy something for a dollar and sell it on for fifty cents, right. and then wonder why it's they're going broke. You know? Right. <laughs> so I think, uh, and that's what Cordon Bleu, Cordon Bleu always have the business at the forefront. Uh -huh. you know, the profitability, the fact that they need to be able to make a profit so that they can be sustainable and that they can all go on to be successful. It is a, it's a full package, it's a, it's a very robust course mm -hmm. and it's proven uh, through the alumni that we have mm -hmm. that the school is Great. Thank you, Chef, for talking to us and it was delightful to have you on the show today. And I hope uh, your answers have been able to enlighten so many aspiring chefs in India. And we look forward to having you again in India. Thank you guys for joining us. And for any other related queries to the Institute or with the chef, you can mail us at editor at happytipsy.in. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Diana. Thank you. Thanks again.